well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to see the film and uh, sticking around for the Q&A. Um, if you missed our intro, I'm Amy Brown. I'm the co-director and producer. This is Jeremy Kaplan, cinematographer and co-director. Joe Sihi, who you might have heard of the Green Burial Council, and Libby Maloney is um, a part of the Natural Death Advocacy Network, which operates here in Victoria. And so if anyone has any questions about local... Um, what's going on locally, then she can really speak pretty in depth into that and where, you know, so can Joe and we're here to answer any questions about the film or the, you know, general movement as well. And special guest as well, Sam Seeky. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be in the film. I used to. I got yeah. cut out. <laughs> He's in the DVD extras. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's something, while well, Jeremy mentioned it, the film was just released um, on Vimeo and DVD all around the world today, so um, we have a store on our website where people can now buy all that, and we've also got DVDs down in the Acme Centre store, and it'll be on iTunes all around the world April 12th, so I'll just plug it before we get started. <laughs> so is there any questions? It's more of a reflection, but, uh, and it, it's what I felt I took away from a fantastic documentary was the opportunity for friends who love Clark very much to be more intimately involved in his farewell. Yeah. That was one of the most beautiful things to see how through the year of filming with Clark, uh, the way in which he actively brought the community in and how the community came out as well for Clark. Um, and just his honesty and the way in which he handled everything and was so gracious um, about the process. And um, so it was really, you know, this learning experience for everyone, all his friends and, and his community. Um, and as you can see in the film with the home funeral, it's like that first couple hours of when his body came back, um, you know, for the people that were there, they weren't experts at this at all it was his friends and you know people were kind of learning and um, it was kind of this wonderful thing to see over those three days and the funeral and the, the months later um, how much it brought his his friends together and connected friends that didn't know each other and the wonderful sort of relationships that came out of the whole experience that I don't think Clark would have anticipated that you know that by you know the dying process that he would actually create all this life as well too, not just from saving the forest in North Carolina, but also bringing all these friends together. Um, I think there's something that just to add in there is there's some really very special people in, in our community here in Melbourne and in regional Victoria and we've learnt a lot from, from the North American experience um, and those people are called um, amongst other things funeral guides or an amicus which is what I call myself um, or a death midwife or a soul doula and they are people that can guide you and help you to, um, to gently facilitate exactly those sort of experiences. Someone like Clark has a resilience and a, an openness and a willingness that he could lead his community in his death care, but um, that's not always possible. So there are people that can help you um, at the Natural Death Advocacy Network. I'm really pleased to, to link you up um, if you ever found yourself in a position, I hope you don't, that, uh, that you were looking for that sort of community around you. Yeah, up How did you choose such a topic? Um, well, this is a question that everyone is always curious to know. Uh, when I was 22, uh, a very close friend of mine's partner um, was diagnosed with malignant melanomas, and he was 29 at the time, and I saw him go from a big kind of early construction worker to a skeleton in nine months and then pass away. And that was a very confronting um, experience for me and uh, was really my first experience, apart from my grandparents, um, with death. And I think once I started to think about my own mortality, it just was a lot of anxiety and fear and there wasn't much around me that was very comforting, um, certainly not funeral practices that I could think of. 
and my sister Sophie was working with a professor at the University of Melbourne just very casually on a um, research basis for green burial and if someone in Australia wanted to start a green burial site they were working towards being able to have tree species and um, areas that they could suggest and maybe just how this could run environmentally and she started to mention this to me over the course of a few years and um, the second she said it I just found it to be really comforting and just a romantic idea that I could be a part of the forest and be buried with my loved ones and we could all give life back to to the earth that we'd sort of taken so much from during our own lives and then you know on a global scale started to think about the impact of even if a fraction of the seven billion of us chose to conserve land through our burial that we could really make a big difference and um, it's a 20 billion dollar a year industry in America and I'm not sure exactly how much it is here in Australia but um, it's a lot of money that could be going towards something really great so that was inspiring and then I'm connected started making a short film for university and was connected th to Jeremy at university and we just started traveling together and then it grew into a feature film as we met Joe and then Clark and then our two co-directors who I should definitely mention Tony and Brian Tony Hale and Brian Wilson came on as the editors after about a year and a half and helped to we had 330 hours of footage and they helped to really um, together with us shape it and mold it into the film and so it felt really respectful to our collaboration that we would all be four co-directors. And the amazing thing was that actually Joe was the one that really introduced us to Clark um, through the experience because Joe at the time was uh, trying to help Clark find a green burial site and and help him through the whole process. So you had been talking with Clark for about six months before. Yeah. And Clark was, because really of the experience he had with Diane that he got to see, was so moved, came to me one day when we were speaking on the phone, he said, if, if I can do anything, and you know of any journalist or there's an opportunity to, to, to be used, you know, in the best sense of the word, please, please let me know. And um, I had met, these guys a little bit earlier and just knew there was a connection and knew that they approached it with the right ethic and sensitivity that was required and um, and uh, that's what, what, what you you see. I think you know a lot of people don't realize when they see the picture that they think well it's invasive but that's really what Clark wanted and it provided him with a great deal of solace to know that you know his, his last act really could function um, to, to inspire others another question uh, about the politics uh, because it must be very hard there's billions and billions involved in this industry and a lot of dis disreputable people yeah. are actually involved I mean I know that in Italy part of the mafia is running uh, the mm. uh, the funeral industry. I don't know how it is in, um, in the States, but if it is that way in, in Italy, it will be the same in the States. So, did you choose not to go on that angle? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, when we first started working on the film, uh, we were well aware of sort of the horror stories in the funeral industry. And in a way, because it's such a sensitive and sacred thing, um, this end of life ritual, um, those stories get told. Um, and they're actually, especially in the United States, and I think mostly it's easy to say generally around the world that so many people who are involved in this are really, really good people. Um, and maybe there's the, you know, the one to five percent or so that do something that's, that's pretty terrible um, and that news comes out and it becomes a big scandal um, and we really felt like when we were approaching people that what we wanted to do was actually tell a much more positive story and especially focusing on the Green Barrel movement it was it was so easy to find this really uplifting and compassionate uh, funeral director or cemeterian 
people who are really doing this for the right reasons. And, um, you know, we, we had some stories and talked with some funeral directors about the sort of the, the seedier side of things in, in the funeral industry, but that really wasn't what interests us. And we felt like, in a way, it would kind of detract from what was the overwhelming message that we kept getting from people, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, people who were choosing Green Burial, whether it was people who had a calling for Green Burial, cemeterians and funeral directors. Um, so it really, it really just, that side of the story spoke to us more so than anything else. Um, and I think, we, yeah, we wanted to make something that would bring people together and not divide us and be antagonistic and we wanted to engage the funeral industry and, and make a film that they could see and they didn't feel like they were being attacked, that they could see that this is just something that people want and, and you need to provide this option um, and where it's not something that's excluding them either. Uh, there are definitely a lot of funeral directors offering this and, you know, there is it's not cutting out all their profits or on a there is a business side to this as well and there is um, a way to make a sustainable business and also offer green burial so um, you know because I, because of that I, we were able to show the film at the ICCFA convention that's in the documentary we showed it there last year to a room of funeral directors and some of them are dismissive, but a lot of them, yeah. you know, like a guy from Champion Embalming Fluid stayed for the entire show and he had absolutely no reason to, um, yeah. but he just liked the story, I guess. So. Yeah, it so, really, yeah. I feel like, converts a lot more people when we took a stance that was, we'll, we'll give a fair share and we're not out to bash the whole industry. And we also really model that approach after what Joe was doing with the Green Barrel Council and seeing how successful that was in bringing people together. And, uh, and we just thought that, you know, if we do a film that's all about bashing the convention, conventional industry, um, that basically the, the actual industry probably won't change at all. It's just going to harden. But um, in a way, we feel like people have been so much more receptive to the film and the message and because of it and because they feel like it, it gives a fair share of uh, respect to, to the work that's there. And it, it is really amazing work that a lot of cemeterians and funeral directors do. Is it, oh, yeah. In the film, um, who owns the majority of the land? where the natural, the green burials are taking place. Do you mean... Each different site? Each site, or the site that Clark was buried at? Well, you sh at the beginning you showed quite a few different sites. Right. Are they owned by the local councils? Are they owned by a burial service? Some of them are happening um, within cemetery, private cemeteries, and they, like in uh, Clark's case, it was a, it was a privately run business, and they opened the Green Burial Gardens as a part of that cemetery. Um, some of them, Green Springs Natural Preserve, at the beginning of the film, is a community run. It's it's very very different state by state, basically, um, but uh, that's sort of a co-op run cemetery where there's a board, and then there are members, and they all vote on um, different, you know. So did they they buy the woods? They bought tract of the woods. Yes. 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 Yeah. The, um, the interesting thing about the difference, I think, that's pretty vast with the United States and Australia is that there's a lot more private cemeteries in the United States, and municipal cemeteries are, are pretty small, actually, in the U.S. Um, so most of the cemeteries in the film are actually privately run, um, but there is one or two, actually, that are actually municipal. In it. And uh, if you want, actually, Joe will talk a little bit more about that too. And there are all sorts of models coming forth where, for example, in a typical cemetery, you don't really buy real estate. You don't have fee title in the land. You buy an interment, right? And with some of the conservation burial models that you saw there, there may be a conservation organization um, that owns fee title of the land. And um, may I think what we're going to start to see is burial on land where some of the proceeds goes to help steward the, the ecosystem 
that hasn't come about yet. In the States, the first park agency in Washington State is actually getting into this. In Texas, there's another one that's starting to do that. And we're, I think, going to start to see new models come forward where the land isn't, isn't really owned by um, anyone, uh, any, any in, in, in term it right, yeah. or individual, um, but there's an option to, to, to uh, you know, to be buried there. But we're very constrained right now in Australia. Uh, in Victoria, we need, as Amy said, to go through some regulatory uh, government cemetery trusts, and a couple of them are exploring this. Libby's involved with one that's doing a green burial suction in um, Dallas group that she can talk about, too. And I think we're going to start to see, as the community comes forward to ask for this, which is what needs to happen, I think there's going to be more receptivity. In the States, there's much more room for entrepreneurship. I just wrote an article for a magazine too. In the states, we have so lo, so let, low expectations, such low expectations for our government. We typically have to organize, and that's how you know yeah. the pro, the nonprofit sector developed in what Alexis de Tocqueville observed a couple hundred years ago. Whereas in Australia, you have such a well-funded um, and functioning government, you know. You, tend to rely on it more. And that's, I like that draw some laughs from people. <laughs> you, laugh, but you have to have some perspective, kids. Yeah. So, what is the private ruling in Australia for land? Like if I had a block of land in the country, what's the story? So in Victoria, here it's different state by state as well. So in Victoria, um, you can only bury on private land, so a single burial on private land under really, really exceptional circumstances. And at the moment, it's it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, they've really cut down on it and, and won't do it at all. Um, so you are required to be buried in a publicly owned cemetery, and that's run by a, a publicly held cemetery trust. Um, there is a lot of work around at the moment trying to get some really some site specific natural sites um, But again, they will be run by a cemetery trust If you pop over the border into New South Wales, then you can be buried on private land There's still a, you know, a rigmarole that you have to go through but um, you can do it and it varies again around the country But here you definitely can't and there are positives and, and negatives to that. A lot of people say, well, that's lovely. Um, I really would like to be buried in my back paddock. But what we experience um, in, in the holistic funeral industry, which is I'm part of, um, is that it actually doesn't serve as longer term. So, so often if that property is sold or if it's developed or something happens to that site, then you can lose access to it. So there are there is a cost and a ben, you know, benefits for, for everything, but he can't do it at the moment. And that's kind of what, what's beautiful about what was started with the Green Barrel Council in the United States, to have those sort of very um, concrete agreements with conservation easements on the, on the land um, to protect it, so that you know from as long as we can sort of guarantee, uh, hopefully perpetuity, that that land is going to stay habitat and the cemetery. Um, and so if you do a lot of these private burials on um, private property, it's, it could be a very wonderful and meaningful thing, but there's not necessarily guarantees that it's going to stay that way. Um, and we were actually in, in New South Wales screening the film and people were very excited because they kept finding out in various places that they could be doing home funerals, uh, home burials, in just five acres. That was the requirement in New South Wales. Five hectares. Five hectares yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I found, or the thing I found was so contrary to the whole feeling of your documentary, was Clive Smith's book, Mother Nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you about that, And we, um, a lot of people make that exact same comment and have that sort of question about the con contradiction. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, Clark wanted to live. He wanted to do everything that he could to um, try and, and beat cancer. And there was the slimmest of chances that the stem cell treatment transplant was going to to work. Um, but there was that slimmer of hope and he, and he took it, being a doctor, 
and a man of science. He just thought, you know, maybe, and he could have lived longer if he hadn't gone to Seattle and if he hadn't had that treatment, but that was sort of the gamble he took. And um, at the end of the day, you know, as he would have wanted a much more natural death. And he wanted be... to die at home. Yeah, he I wanted mean, to he die at home. He clearly wasn't planning on dying in the hospital. And uh, it's really hard to have one person stand in for sort of all of the American, you know, funeral industry or the, you know, our Western sort of science. But I think in a way it is very emblematic of in the United States. And I think it's also throughout Europe as well, too, and possibly here as well, that that notion that uh, Western science, the idea of dying is failure and, and to, to give up. Um, and you know, to do palliative care, hospice care, um, is sometimes in, in doctors' minds a, a sense of failure, or, or not you know using Western medicine for what it should be used for. Um, and uh, but the United States is definitely changing. There's a lot more receptivity to hospice care and palliative care. And Clark was actually in hospice care for um, several months, and also palliative care. Um, and he actually talks about that in one of the voicemails um, that's in the film as well. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it is a very fascinating sort of contradiction that Clark was planning his own home funeral and green burial and accepting life, or accepting his death, but then also fighting as hard as possible to extend his life. And it's sort of one of those things for us, when people say you're trying to make a film about natural burial, why do you have an unnatural death in there and at the end of the day we're documenting somebody's life and we couldn't, you know, change, you know, tell him. I he... think that's what makes it more real to us, that he tried everything and nothing worked. He tried everything, everything. Yeah. And then the um, dichotomy of him being all hooked up and everything and then those beautiful old-fashioned people with, you know, shovels and it was just that's exactly why it worked for me because yeah. he was a man of science and tried everything yeah mm -hmm. to me that's why it yeah. works and in my experience yeah. too that is the way of everyone that mm -hmm. that all young people and and by that really anyone <laughs> under 70 or 80 is will try everything to save their own life mm. um and so if i could just put in a quick plug for advanced care planning um, that, that people really consider documenting their wishes um, about how they would and where they would like to die. So in the circumstances, it's exceptional circumstances where you've seen it happen, but so often, of course, we have strokes or uh, are in car accidents or things like that happen that, that are unexpected, and um, documenting how and where you would like that to be managed is something that would be an enormous gift to your family. Yeah, that's the biggest thing when people say, what's your call to action, is uh, letting people know what you want. Um, yeah. and, and Just tell them where you have the envelope. Well, exactly. And, and having, yeah, having, having an doing. advocate is really key, too. And this has been studied with my father. He, he, when he thought he was going to die in the hospital, refused to eat and refused to have a feeding tube. When we brought him home for hospice, he lived for another 19 months and had a will to live. So things change, and you have to just honor where people are at. I think it's really important, in addition to the planning um, and the documentation being in place, having someone there that can execute for you is really, really, really key. Yeah. I, I came to the conclusion that dying is a process rather than a, an event. Mm. Would anyone like to comment on that? <laughs> That's true. It's yeah. very true. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't just happen over. I mean, sometimes it happens very suddenly. But it's we're all, in a way, coming to terms with this right now as our lives go on. It's going to happen to every single one of us, ten out of ten. So, um, yeah, it's kind of how do you accept it and then live your life with that, rather than I think before going through this whole process myself, I just you know had such a as I said, ne negative uh, relationship with it. And I think the more that I just kind of understand that this is something part of the life cycle and it's going to happen, I just, 
I feel more free to live my life and not, um, you know, live it more fully and not yeah. be scared of something that is just going to be happening anyway. So. I was also going to say, I think the, the whole notion of process instead of event also really applies to the grieving process. And I think that's part of what uh, home burials, natural burials, green burials acknowledge as well too, that having several days instead of just one event um, and understanding that basically grief will come and go in places and you, you can't really plan it or, and you can't schedule it. And there, that's something about sort of the conventional uh, modern funeral industry has kind of wanted to do is, is put it in a place and have a specific time and, uh, you know, that to kind of really try to have everything down to a T and scheduled, which, which really doesn't work for most people. So it's definitely a good observation to be like it's an ongoing process. Um. As, as death being a process, I think that um, the movie is supposed to make you think about that process and how um, it's it's really it's it's not something that we can prevent or think about. We can think about it, but it's the movie's uh, real purpose is to make you reconsider death and the choices you will make with your funeral and how you can give back to the environment at the time of death instead of, I guess, take from it. Very well said, sir. Yeah. So, with that in mind, where are we best to go to find out more uh, about that options in Victoria? Yeah. So, the Natural Death Advocacy Network, which if you um, Google NDAN, N-D-A-N, dot com dot au, I've got some cards here if you'd like. Um, it's been designed by a group, it's a not-for-profit volunteer organisation, that's designed to network exactly that question. So, there are really good options around. Um, there's a lot of work happening about um, how to make the options more broadly available. Um, but specific questions, if you email or get in contact with us at NDAN, then we can um, direct you to the right service providers um, who can help to assist you to plan for the natural burial, um, people that can assist with a home funeral. Um, all, all, all the choices that were explored in the movie are possible here, and most importantly, they're legal here, and um, they're beautiful. So, yeah, get in touch with us and we'd be more than happy to give you a hand. I would also mention there's the, uh, the Greater Melbourne Cemeteries Trust, which Joe is just sort of maybe starting to work with. and uh, there, there's a, It seems to be receptivity, and I think that they need to hear from the community. It's funny, last year, I, when I was thinking about this, I because it's a governmental body, just made the... Um, the assumption that they would be, you know, very much on it and wanting to find what the community needs were, but I think the community nodding going around in the room, of, you know, from people, staff, and 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 board members. So people know this is coming, and they and I think they need some help. I think we also need to see verifiable standards that make sense in an Australian context, similar to what was done in the states. It's a or great organizing tool, and it, you know, there's some things that just don't make sense um, to sort of transplant. There are not really the same issues in some, some ways, you know, there aren't. But I, I, think, um, I think that's going to happen inevitably too. Yeah. Can I ask, um, is there on your journey, has, uh, has the resistance been more, have you had, have you had varying resistance from different religious groups, um, some that are more open to it than others, or is the resistance political more than religious, or both? Do you mean, um, well, the interesting thing is religious groups wise actually are incredibly receptive towards green burial. Um, across, the, across the faiths? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, you know, traditional Muslim Jewish burial, even, you know, very traditional Christian burial, you should be doing shroud burials. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of, uh, we, we interviewed some Jewish cemeteries that were getting involved with Green Burial. Some of them are Green Burial Council certified. 
And uh, yeah, a lot of places, a lot of green burial sites uh, have sections um, for all sorts of religious faiths and they're very open-minded and are welcoming and bring in all faiths. So the, the religious component of it is actually what's drawing a lot of people in. Um, you'd be surprised how in the United States the green barrel hotspots aren't necessarily in these sort of eco-chic areas. People assume that San Francisco and New York City have tons of green burial sites and actually the sort of what has become the epicenters have been in the Midwest and the South places like South Carolina and North Carolina where Clark was based. Um, you know, actually end up having more green burial sites currently right now than New York State or California. Um, and uh, so, and part of that is because people are um, drawn to it by the sort of, for Christians, the sort of ashes to ashes, dust to dust, very simple, plain pine casket or shroud burial. And, um, and so politically, I mean, I think there's, uh, the eco-minded are definitely drawn to it for, for those reasons. Um, but in a way, because green burial isn't, isn't really politicized in the United States, um, and that it's very sort of open-ended, it, it allows a lot of people to come to it. Um, so I'd say, actually, if you're talking about sort of if there's any pushback, um, some of it's been mainly from the funeral industry. The supply companies in particular, the mall yeah. manufacturers. Chemical cap, companies. Cap, you know, obviously. And, and in the States, they've tried to greenwash and introduce some confusion in the marketplace, which was to be expected. But they learned in, that with cremation, which was a movement, you know, that grew pretty quickly, that you can't really get in the way of what people want. And there are some, there's that entrenched group of people that are going to cling to the past and there's much of the industry that wants to sort of deindustrialize and bring forward a new ethic and that's been really encouraging. Because there's no advanced, organized lobby against green burials, you know, in a progressive sense. No. 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 The main excuse that you hear from the funeral industry is, well, no one's asking for it, so why should we supply something? And Joe's line is my favorite response to that. It's like, when do you go into a restaurant and order something that's not on the menu? You know, people don't know to ask for it. And so the funeral industry is so happy to be complacent and, you know, keep providing the options that they're comfortable with, the options that they know that they can merchandise and, you know, upscale and upsell. So, um, yeah, it really has to come from a, a demand side, it seems. The, the real innovation, I was going to say, in Australia, the exciting thing is I think we're going to start to see this merchandise-based model of death transcended because you don't have the regulatory, regulatory constraints that you do in the U.S. Because as in Australia, right now, anyone can go out as a funeral director, right? But I think we're going to start to see people with the psychosocial spiritual skills which we've seen in the palliative care community come forward and people like Libby who want to bring forward a different model and a different ethic, that's what has to happen. I think that's what most people are in agreement on, that there's something really crass about forcing people to make decisions, especially at the time someone you know loses a loved one. We want to have people that can hold space so we can do what we need to do, which we do naturally, and, and deal, begin to deal with the grieving process. And uh, I think that Australia has more potential to bring that forward than any place else on the planet right now. Yeah. And he's prim primarily for two reasons. One is we don't have as many laws um, stopping and things like you have to be embalmed to be seen by the public. That's all just not true here. You don't need to be embalmed here at all for anything except for um, long distance um, travel or for repatriation overseas. Um, but the other thing is we don't have um, societal practices that are similar too. So we're most of the way along the way to natural burial by the fact that we don't have concrete vaults um, and having a stainless steel casket or that sort of thing is still really unusual, even in the conventional um, industry here in Australia. So we're a long way along the way. There's just a couple of quick things. Um, in New South Wales at the moment, a Muslim person can be buried in a shroud directly into the earth without any question, without any permit, without anything. But if you want to do it for environmental or re other social reasons, you need to fill in a form. Um, so that gives you an idea of how, in fact, this is being driven by um, religious groups actually getting what they want. And, and so everybody should be entitled to it, irrespective of creed or lack of creed. 
Um, and but in Victoria, shroud burial is legal, and you just need to ask for it. Well, and to wind things up, just um, wanted to thank everyone for coming. Thank Libby and thank Joe. Um, also thank Acme and Climb Art Festival, which is um, hosting the screening. And again, you know, we're a super independent production, and, and so if you you know enjoyed the film, we'd really love it if you told your friends about it or liked us on Facebook. We have Twitter, Instagram, um, and it just, it, again, is available on iTunes, Vimeo, and DVD. Um, so, yeah, just thank you for your support. It really does mean a lot. And one more thing that I wanted to say was that um, it's about uh, four years, actually, since Clark passed away. Um, this weekend. It was, yeah, this weekend, basically. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to screen the film still and show it. It feels like it's in a way it keeps Clark's memory going and watching it today it was uh, kind of emotional actually because being all the way across the world and having people be able to get a chance to experience who Clark was uh, is really special so I hope um, you know I hope he wanted to make an impact and I'm so glad that his story has and that we've been able to do that and uh, yeah, it's it's always special to share it. So I hope uh, I hope you get a chance to sort of share it with other people and talk about it, and uh, really appreciate it. So it's always special to screen it.